You're tuned into More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Happy Saturday, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and I've had more questions asked of me and concerns in the last few weeks about the economy, inflation, the stock market, Federal Reserve policy, all of those things, really probably since 2008. Now, certainly things got a little bit crazy in March of 2020, and people were very, very worried about a global pandemic, Uh, but this has been a challenge, to say the least. Stock stock investment is way down uh, through, through April, as is bond investment, and so it begs the question, what should you be doing? Uh, Today, we have on David Wagner. He is a lead portfolio manager with Aptis Capital. He's responsible for equity research selection and the evaluation of macro-level trends, and he is a chartered financial analyst. He is also a regular contributor on CNBC, Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, and Barron's. Good morning, David. Great to have you with us. Jim, I am excited to be here. Thanks for asking me to uh, come on the show on a beautiful Saturday morning. Yeah, I guess you're up in Cincinnati, right? Uh, yeah, I'm out of Cincinnati, and I probably shouldn't be telling your listeners, uh, being most of them Knoxville natives and Balls fans, everyone at heart, I'm a Kentucky Wildcats fan, and I ask one thing of you today. Please do not hold that against me. You guys I won't hold it against you, but I, I, I won't. consecutive wins in a row against <laughs> us in the football season, so that's enough. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you, I won't, I won't hold it against you, but I do just want to mention that our baseball team last night clinched the SEC regular season championship with uh, four I, more I, games I, to go. I, <laughs> so. I love it. I love it. I know you're one of the biggest volunteer fans out there, so you know I'm glad we can be good friends, Jim. Absolutely. David, you've spent your career focused on market research, macro-level trends, security selection, stocks. What got you interested in this field? Did you go to college thinking you would do this? Talk a little bit about your background and what really got you attracted to this. No, I love bringing the, the personal aspect to this. So going down to school in Lexington, Kentucky, where obviously I have to bring it back to, to that, um, I started going to Keeneland Racetrack. And, you know, at its core, everything revolving around the parimutuel betting system of horse racing and odds and understanding data to try to come to some cohesive decision on who to bet on, you know, what is the most bang for the buck you can get for some type of horse really got me interested. And, you know, there's not too many uh, uh, longstanding careers out there in the horse industry when just solely regarding betting. So I, you know, my freshman year at University of Kentucky, I sat down and I started reading some, some amazing books like, you know, The Millionaire Next Door, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that really just got me started in looking at stocks. And, you know, I, I love analyzing data. I, I'm a numbers guy. Um, so, you know, it was kind of the, 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 the career path of my choice. And I was very fortunate to have a great upbringing uh, at a firm called Opus, uh, uh, getting kind of the genesis, the basis, the cornerstone for my investing standards. And, you know, I was very even more lucky to be brought on by the team uh, at Aptis uh, by J.D. Gardner, our CEO, CIO out of there to kind of help lead the charge on the equity side. So very fortunate. But, yeah, you know, it was at its core, it was actually horse racing that brought me really into this industry or got me interested in this industry. And, and That's if I remember very, right, Jim, you were just at the uh, Kentucky Derby, weren't you? Just I was. Week? I was at the Kentucky Derby, and I, you had sent me an email on Friday, and I did not get it until I got back. But it was funny because you were walking through your picks. And at the time you made those picks, uh, Rich Strike wasn't even in the race yet. <laughs> pretty, it's <laughs> pretty amazing. Horses, Jim, except for Rich Strike. Yeah, yeah, funny, exactly. Uh, be, being a horse lover, I actually own one or two horses. 
And the jockey on Rich Strike, Sonny Leon, he's ridden one of my horses, Indian Fever and Captain Riley, before. So, wow. you know, it really struck home. So it, it was a really cool experience for, for all of race, uh, right, the racing world on last Saturday. Yeah, that's a great word. Well, let's dive in. We got a lot to talk about. I know our listeners want to hear from you. Let, let's start with inflation. Um, you know, it's interesting how we've gotten here. We had the global pandemic. We've had supply chain issues. Those issues have been exacerbated by Russia-Ukraine conflict. And then we've had massive stimulus from both the Federal Reserve and from Congress. Talk a little bit about where we are. You know, inflation this yeah. week was released at 8.3%. It was 8.5% in March. What is your perspective on where we are, big picture? Yeah, um, obviously inflation right now is the hottest topic out there. I mean, it's affecting everyone's life from a purchasing power perspective. And right now what I'm seeing in the market, just because I'm very in tune with the market, is that I believe that we're going to continue to see uh, market volatility as long as we haven't had peak inflation. And that report that you just brought up there, Jim, is very important because this was the first month that inflation was coming up against difficult comps. So a lot of market pundits from a mechanical standpoint was going, hey, this is the month that we're going to see some type of peak inflation. And the numbers that we came in, the 8.3% on headline that you just mentioned, Jim, really did not show that. Because if you look underneath the hood of inflation, a lot of the stickier aspects continue to increase. A lot of the transitory aspects of inflation have started to come down. But that latter part doesn't bother me a whole lot. It's the former part, that the stickier aspects in, of inflation look to be sticking around a lot longer than normal. Look at wage inflation. Just look at um, apartment and housing prices. Those are huge components to the inflation number. <clears throat> so you know that, that's really somewhat worrisome to me. But I'm going to take it a step back here because we all understand – that inflation is here. And I, I think I'd want to focus on, you know, what might cause inflation to subside. And I think I'd start off with talking about, hey, what type of inflation are we currently seeing here right now? Because this cycle over the last years has been very, very odd. Because we know that typically business cycles are driven by durable goods and then a financial crisis. And durables, uh, durable goods are basically where you build up unwanted inventories. And with inventories high, firms cut production. When you cut production, you cut jobs. When you cut jobs, you cut income. That's understandable right there. And income declining leads to the leveraged players in this market suffering. And if there's some type of contagion event and if it cascades over, you have some type of financial crisis, much like what we saw back in 2008. That's a typical recession. <clears throat> but that's not what's happened over the last two years. The contagion was actually health-related versus financially related. And income was actually preserved by aggressive fiscal and monetary policy responses as the pandemic hit. Services, which are usually stable during a recession, they suffered the most. We understand that the economy was shut down. But that meant that income flowed into goods. Really, Jim, it actually overflowed into goods. So we overwhelmed the global supply chain as bottlenecks developed, and then we had inflation skyrocket. So what's going to cause this inflation to subside? And in my inflation, infl in my opinion, pardon me, inflation is simply a supply side problem. It's actually not a demand problem. And Jim, this is actually a hot take. You know, anyone who listens to CNBC or Bloomberg, um, that's pretty unconventional because they always say that demand has a key part in this. But I can debunk that actually pretty quickly. From Q4 19 to Q4 2021, real GDP rose from about 19.2 trillion to 19.8 trillion. And that equates to, you know, to an annualized growth rate of 1.4%. So hardly any rampant economic growth rate there. So, you know, you could move further into this ostensibly oversupport of policy regime period and take a look at, you know, personal consumption from that same period. You know, you had an annualized average growth rate of 1.8%. So, again, subpar performance by any historical standard. So demand's not driving inflation, Jim. That's what those numbers right there state. It's all supply side driven less supply driving up prices and the current market narrative you know for the covid period is not one where demand is running gangbusters fueled by excess stimulus again this is a hot take i will i will acknowledge that it's really just a story where we just saw contracted real gdp growth from its long-term trend as we hit huge covid induced supply chain problems so what's going to slow this down um i have two beliefs one's kind of going to be a little bit more short term and one's going to be a little bit more 
long term. On the short term aspect, you have supply chain easement. You know, the economy needs to see some type of relief in this area. And then this should allow competition to drive down pricing as companies will obviously, you know, what I've seen anecdotally in my career, they're always going to try to garner market share with cheaper pricing, especially if their input costs are dropping. Obviously, that's not the case right now, but moving forward. If you look out long term, yeah, I think productivity will continue to drive inflation down. That's what we've seen, you know, dating back to early 2000s. We had the globalization with the introduction of China. Just think of what you could have, you know, purchased a TV for back in 2000, say $2,000. Now you can get an unbelievable 65 inch from Walmart for, you know, $300 right now. So I do think that productivity over the longer period of time is going to drive down inflation. And if you just look at last quarter, you know, we do have GDP higher than pre-GDP. We have higher GDP right now than pre-COVID, pardon me. And we're doing that with 4 million less workers. And that's what productivity is, more output given the level of labor involved. And that means that we're becoming a more efficient economy and productivity is a disinflationary source. But Jim, the wild card here for me right now that can really throw the wrench in the spokes of the tires is wage inflation. All right, we're seeing the yep. lower cohorts of America definitely, you know, uh, see increase in their wages, and that then creates a floor in wages moving forward. And, so that's that's my big worry, Jim. And actually, David, that's interesting that you said that because in that in, in all that you were just saying, I wanted to ask you another question about wage inflation. <laughs> we had some economists really bringing up some concerns about this back four or five months ago. It was hard for me to imagine that with the wage inflation we're seeing, that eventually doesn't cascade down into bigger inflationary issues in the overall economy. So do I hear you saying that you think that is the single biggest issue longer term to get our arms around? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, the lower end of cohorts in the United States definitely were for the last 20 years, give or take, we're not the beneficiaries of increasing wages. So in my mind, they're they're somewhat starting to get their their due here. Um, But yeah, I mean, that's like I said there, Jim, what we're seeing with wage inflation, it's just going to create a floor. It's going to be the new standard, the new normal. Yeah, um, so that. that's probably my biggest worry right now. Tell you what, we're going to get to our first break. We're visiting with David Wagner. He's with Aptus Capital, and we're discussing the challenges in the economy right now. When we come back, we'll discuss Fed, the Fed policy uh, to deal with inflation and what is the likely outcome of that economically. So stay with us. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and do check us out online. Uh, If you go to broganfinancial.com and click on radio, you can catch all of our podcasts of our show. Also, my dollars and cents segments, four to five minute segments I run two, three times a month here on this show. Also, my retirement minutes that I run Uh, throughout the week on this station. So do check us out, broganfinancial.com. Click on radio uh, to download and and listen to more content. We're visiting with David Wagner this morning. He's a portfolio manager, a lead portfolio manager with Aptus Capital. He's responsible for equity research selection and macro level trends, which is exactly what we're talking about today, as I know many of you are concerned about the economy, inflation, the stock market, and how it ultimately can affect your money and your financial planning. David, let's uh, you, let, let's talk about the Federal Reserve's response to inflation and, and how effective you think it may be. I, I have been saying for a while now that I think the Fed waited too late uh, to address the issue, and I think they're in a little bit of a panic mode. Uh, talk about, I guess, two things. One, do you think they can h- get their arms around this, and how long do you think that might take? And, and how do you expect them to try to do that? Well, I think that the market is really starting to understand that the Fed was somewhat late to the game on a tightening perspective, exactly uh, to your commentary. Actually, in fact, just this week, Fed Chair Chairman Jerome Powell said, hey, maybe we started, you know, raising rates and tightening just a little bit too late. I mean, if you just go back three months ago, 
we had some type of QE policy, quantitative easing policy, still in line when we had, yeah. you know, pretty low labor uh, or great labor numbers, low unemployment. But, you know, I think let's just talk about you know, what the Fed is doing, what they did do, and, you know, how it's going to affect the market to your question. And I think I'd want to start with William Chesney Martin's famous punch bowl metaphor. And for those who don't know this, um, Martin was really the first to say that it was the Fed's role to take away the punch bowl just as the party gets going. Today, though, I think uh, we made a little <laughs> tweak to this metaphor that the, uh, we need, there's a new unconventional, unconventional rate punch bowl that was really filled to the brim in March of 2020 as we hit the lower bound on interest rates. So basically, the rate, pull, rate punch bowl was full. There was no ability to add any more punch. So the Fed had to bring out an unconventional QE punch bowl. So the unconventional punch bowl is the quantitative quantitative easing aspect that was really first introduced during the financial crisis. And during this financial crisis, when the rate bowl was, you know, full, that newfangled punch got the party going big time. I mean, the S&P 500 off the COVID bottom of March 23rd of 2020 was up about 100% at one point. And in my opinion, Jim, you know, without this unconventional, unconventional punch during the financial crisis or the COVID crisis, um, I think we'd be staring down the, the gun barrel of some type of 1930s type of recession. So it was awesome that we added this unconventional QE punch bowl. But I don't think anyone, Jim, this morning listening on this beautiful Saturday morning believes that the Fed should be performing any more QE. And as I just mentioned, they were doing it just three months ago. And within a month later, the Fed started pulling away that punch bowl. They started raising rates. They raised rates 50, 25 basis points in March and 50 basis points in, in April. So, yeah, they took that punch bowl away. So that's what they've been doing. But what's going on now, Jim? They're merely focusing, moving from a QE regime to a quantitative tightening regime, which is something that I'm really starting to focus on as an investor because right now, given where inflation is, we just talked about inflation, this is probably one of the biggest things occurring in the market, that type of transition right there. Hey, hey David, tell, tell, us, tell our listeners – Tell our listeners real quick, when you say QE tightening, t t explain to our listeners a little bit more about what, what that means and what the Fed is doing. Yeah. So they had that punch bowl come out. They, they had quantitative easing really start to occur. They did that to introduce more liquidity into the market, and they could do that by two ways. Like I just stated, they can lower the Fed funds rate, which they lowered to zero, and they can do some type of easing where they, they buy – bonds out there, treasuries and mortgage backed securities to push liquidity into the market. Now they're transitioning into more of a quantitative tightening, and the acronym I use there is QT. And what that means is that they're doing the exact opposite actually now. They're taking away the liquidity, taking away that punch bowl from the investment world by increasing interest rates, by letting um, you know, assets on their balance sheet roll off. That's what they have historically done for QT, those two things, increasing interest rates and letting assets on their balance sheet roll off. But there's new commentary that they could introduce a third way of QT, which has actually never been done before. They can actually sell assets off their balance sheet. We haven't gotten to that point, but you know, I know back in 2010 to 2013 and even in the early 2000s, there was discussion of that. So those are the differences between QE and QT. And then, uh, David, are these more, though, demand-style uh, efforts at, at solving inflation, where, where you mentioned that it's more of a supply issue. Yeah, the, we know at its core the Fed can do nothing to um, curb or help supply chain. That's out of their bailiwick. That's out of their arm's length. Of they, they, they just don't have the tools in their, their tool belt to really attack that. The way that they can really attack um, monetary policy is on that demand side. And they do that through pulling the lever of liquidity. So obviously through some type of QT environment, they're pulling back that liquidity, which should helpfully curb uh, demand to some extent. Because right now, you know, this, like I told you, the supply side is the problem, not the demand. But they're trying to attack inflation through the demand perspective because that's the only way that they can attack inflation. And that's what they're doing through the use of quantitative tightening. So as we move deeper into 2022, you know, it's expected they'll continue to increase rates. I guess uh, they, they kind of took a three-quarter point rate. They at least said that's kind of off the table. Is that right? As of right now, Jerome Powell said that a 75 basis point hike is off the table. And he mentioned that last Wednesday. And after he mentioned that, that was the big takeaway news. 
the market started to rally because that was more of a dovish take. The word dove is more synonymous with QE. A hawk is that verbiage, hawk being hawkish, is more synonymous with being uh, more pro quantitative tightening. So the market took that as more of a dovish response from Fed, Fed Chair Jerome Powell that, hey, we're not going to hike 75. You know, we're going to be comfortable with maybe 50 over this meeting and next meeting. And that's why the market jumped 3% on Wednesday. But just the following day, we actually had the market pull back 3.6% because they, they really started to digest the fact that, hey, we don't believe Fed Chair Jerome Powell at 50 basis points. We actually truly believe that we could do 75. More importantly, that was coincided with data coming out from a previous topic we just spoke about right there, Jim, from something called ULCs, and that stands for unit labor costs. Unit labor costs came out on Thursday, which were much higher than expected, and that's why the market believes, hey, you know what, Jerome? You know, we believed you yesterday at only 50 basis point rate hikes for, you know, the next two months. But after that ULC data came out, ah, we, we, we don't believe you as much. So the market definitely turned to a more hawkish standpoint. And that's one of the core reasons, Jim, as why we've seen a lot of volatility in the market, especially what we saw on Monday with the substantial pullback then. Yeah, and actually in our next segment, I want to get into the volatility in the market. But before we do, uh, in this segment, on the inflation issue, going deeper into this year, uh, with these rate increases and doing some quantitative tightening, do you think that inflation will come down at least somewhat? And if so, how much? I know I'm asking you, David, to look into a crystal ball, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can kind of give you opinion, my opinion on what I think the Fed should do to try to help curb uh, inflation while creating some type of soft land, soft landing here. Mechanically speaking, I do think that the number, the, the headline number for inflation has to come down because we're coming up against very difficult cops, all right? But underneath the hood of inflation, we're continuing to see a lot of those stickier assets, the sticker inflation numbers, pardon me, really stay true and with us. What I think that the Fed needs to do to really curb inflation is they need to act on increasing rates very fast right now. The market has given them a get out of jail free card because the market understands that inflation is too high. More importantly, actually, the people that put Jerome Powell in his uh, FOMC chairman seat, Washington. Washington, D.C. is also giving him somewhat a get-out-of-jail-free card because, hey, Jim, right now, this year, it's a midterm election. Yeah. And with inflation running rampant right now, I can tell you that the Democrats in Washington don't want inflation where it is. So the Federal Reserve needs to increase interest rates as soon as they possibly can right now to curb, it, to curb inflation because as we head into the latter half of this year, Jim, we're going to start to see PMI figures start to come down. That's a measure – of manufacturer goods, the output for manufacturer goods that we're expecting. Now, many economists are expecting a slowdown in the second half. And the Fed gets really put in a bind where they could potentially not have a soft landing if they're quickly increasing rates in a slowing growth environment. Right now, the, Jim, the market is still growing. We've seen EPS expectations for the S&P 500 increase 10% since the beginning of the year. The economy is still strong. We still have great profit margins right now, holistically, for the S&P 500. They're starting to obviously go sideways and start to come down. But right now, we still see strong growth. So this is the exact time that the Fed needs to act, and they need to act very quickly. And that's how you're going to get inflation down and potentially create some type of soft landing. That's interesting that you mentioned the uh, midterm election cycle. I can't tell you how much I've had people ask me or make comments about the impact of the election on on this type of policy. We know that the Fed is supposed to be geopolitical. The reality is they are getting a lot of pressure, although you're calling it a get out of jail free card, which I think is a great analogy. Uh, but you know what I hear you saying is affirming what many of our listeners think, which is there is some in, in certain influence in Washington uh, that could end up changing what this policy would look like this year as opposed to if it was a non-election year. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that we've seen over the last two presidential cycles, we've seen more push to have them act quicker or act more in terms to help their party out. But I do think that we know that the Federal Reserve and Washington, D.C. are two different entities. They need to have an arm's length distance between them. Wow. That's at least how historically that they've run with Bernanke, um, you know, with, uh, uh, pardon me, Volcker back in the 80s. But, you know, it seems like they're becoming a little bit more friendlier together. But I still believe that Jerome Powell understands the, the wherewithal that he needs to keep that arm length uh, distance away from them. Because at its core right now, inflation 
um, it's it, what's going on right now is going to affect the credibility of the Fed and how the market's going to believe them in future crises on how they're going to 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 react. So yeah, yeah I, I do think that they might be a little bit more bed together right now, but we know that they still need to remain separate entities. Yeah. So uh, well, what I hear you saying, David, is at its core, you think there is an effort from the Fed to remain more apolitical, even though there might be a little bit in you know the, they're a little friendlier than maybe they ideally would be, but there is an effort on their part to try to stay apolitical. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think I'd touch on one more thing, Jim, here when it comes to uh, midterm election, election years. Obviously, right now, there's a lot of macro overhang in the market. We have a war in Ukraine with Russia. We have increasing interest rates. We have obviously what we spoke about here with inflation. But midterm election years, Jim, tend to see tend to be one of the most volatile years in the market. On average, I was looking at some data just this morning um, dating back to the 1960s. The average correction during a midterm election year is 19.2%. Like, Thus far, what we've seen in the S&P 500, we had about a 19.9% correction right now. So the volatility that we tend to see in midterm election years, we're just on par with that actually right now. That's pretty fascinating data. I tell you what, we're visiting with David Wagner. He's a lead portfolio manager at Aptus Capital. He's also a regular contributor on CNBC, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and Barron, someone who's become a good friend over the, over the last couple of years. When we come back, I want to talk about the effect on the stock market. Are we headed to recession? When we talk about a soft landing, does David think that the Fed can induce a soft landing? And what does that ultimately mean for your money? So stay tuned. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. We're with you every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, you can also catch all of our podcasts uh, on our website. Go to broganfinancial.com and click on radio. My fall classes at Pellissippi State and the University of Tennessee through their adult education start back in August. I'm, I actually have a new one-night class on retirement income planning. It's on August the 30th at Pellissippi State in Hardin Valley. And again, it is a one night class. I believe that course fee is $39. Uh, you can ca get our entire class schedule at broganfinancial.com and click on classes. And you can download syllabus for all those classes. My next two part class, Financial Survival for Retirement at the University of Tennessee, uh, is on September 20th and 27th. Uh, but you can check out my full schedule. Again, this is adult education, non-credit. If you're retired or getting ready to retire, uh, that's who this class is. Th these classes are for. We're visiting this morning with David Wagner, a friend of mine. He's, he's the lead portfolio manager at Aptus Capital. And we're talking about the current economic environment, inflation, Federal Reserve, and all of those challenges David, let's get into the stock market. Um, first off, give us a little bit of perspective. We've seen a lot of volatility of late. Uh, coming into this year, I felt like and talked on this program that I felt like 2022 would be a more choppy, volatile year. Now, interestingly, you've brought up the correlation with midterm election years. But from an overall perspective, how volatile is this? Is this normal? Is it an anomaly? the type of movements we're seeing, especially in the last few weeks? We've seen a lot of volatility just this entire year, Jim. You're exactly right. And being good friends that we are, you know, we've worked really hand in hand to kind of prognosticate heading into this year and really talk with a lot of clients and investors that this is going to be a choppy year, that investors really need to start to curb their enthusiasm heading into this year. Um, and what we've seen just last week, really encompasses the volatility that we've seen in this market just year to date. In fact, I, I kind of referenced uh, about 10 minutes ago the return of the S&P 500 last Wednesday and Thursday. Last Wednesday, the S&P 500 was up 3%. The following day, the S&P 500 was down 3.6%. So let's put that into historical perspective on how does, that stand, how does that rate versus other periods of volatility. And that period that we saw Wednesday and Thursday – 
stacks up there with periods that we saw back in 1987, back in the financial crisis during um, COVID in 2020. There's actually only been eight cases ever where we've seen that much volatility over the standpoint of two days. One of them came in 87, uh, about two came in 2008 and 2009 after the Lehman collapse, and then three occurred during the COVID recession. So we are somewhat in rarefied air right now, Jim. And as I mentioned, I think that we are going to continue to see volatility in the market until we get some type of peak inflation reading. So, so in your view, the number one catalyst of the volatility is inflation. And until the market sees that that's coming down a little bit, you expect continued volatility. Absolutely. I mean, we have been in a disinflationary environment for the last four decades. We haven't seen this type of inflation since the early 80s, the early era of Reagan, the era of Volcker, who had to substantially increase interest rates to really push the U.S. economy into recession just to combat inflation. I, I don't think we're there. I don't think Fed Chair Jerome Powell is going to act Volcker. She's going to be a little bit more of a maestro um, and kind of spread the waters between uh, being a Volcker and a Greenspan, meaning that he's going to be a little bit more hands-on and diligent, trying not to send the U.S. economy into some type of recession. But yeah, inflation right now, Jim, is driving any and all movements in the market because interest rates are kind of a a subcategory of inflation. Right now, interest rates are continue to climb, continue to increase. We had the 10-year over 3%. We had the five-year U.S. mortgage rate go over 5% for the first time since 2018. It's kind of right now that um, inflation is kind of wagging the tail of the dog of interest rates. Well, and interestingly enough, when we talk about, so you're saying we're kind of in rarefied air here with volatility. Talk a little bit about the reaction in both the stock and bond market with the Fed raising rates, because through April, both those markets are substantially down, and that's not normal uh, historically, especially in the early days, when the, in, in those early stages of Fed tightening. Can you touch a little bit on that? How unusual is that? Uh, it is very unusual. And if you remember the genesis of a lot of the conversation when we became great friends, Jim, is that myself and yourself and my firm really saw kind of the writing on the wall that, historically speaking, bonds have been the safe asset class. Stocks are the risk asset class. But given the current environment where investors need to look through the windshield and not the rearview mirror, you know, we need to treat portfolios different because, hey, bonds may not, be, may not prove to be as insulated during downturns as they have historically been. Bonds were in a 40-year bull market up until probably August of 2020 as we had the 10-year interest rate come down from like 18 percent down to you know, 26 basis points right there that bonds have been just an unbelievable mechanism for return over the last 40 years. But given the inflationary environment, given where absolute interest rates currently are right now, we know the genesis of our conversation that I just mentioned, Jim, was, hey, like, we need to treat portfolios different because bonds may not be as insulative as they have been historically. And if we look back, Jim, over the last eight years that the S&P 500 has been negative, so that's only eight times since 1977, the S&P 500 – has had an average uh, negative return of, say, 10% during those years. And every single one of those eight years, Jim, the Barclays Ag, which is the benchmark, the measure for fixed income, the measure for bonds, every year it's been positive. There's been an inverse correlation. But just this year, that has not occurred. Right now, as of uh, close Friday, the S&P 500 was down 15.6%. The Barclays Ag, the measure of fixed income, was down 10%. So right now, what investors are seeing right now, feeling right now from their investment portfolios, has never occurred. This year, year-to-date through Friday, the normal 60-40 portfolios, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, is having its worst year-to-date ever. Right now, it's down 11.5%, that 60-40 portfolio. The second worst start was back in 1977 when the 60-40 portfolio was only down 4.2%. That's 7% worse than the second worst reading ever through the first four months of the year. So yeah, Jim, we are in rarefied air right now. It's stressful well, times the, right now. Yeah, and David, one of the things I've been talking about really for a couple of years now is the unusual, the, the unusual reality that in terms of valuation, stocks are very, have been very expensive. Uh, and bonds have also been very expensive because when interest rates are down, stock uh, bond values are up. 
And we really never had that type of an economic reality where both have been priced with high valuations at the same time. And so we've been talking for a while about the danger of a 60-40 portfolio. So I tell you what, we're going to get to our last break. And when we come back with David Wagner, uh, a lead portfolio manager with Aptis Capital, what does this mean for you as an investor? What does this mean for your retirement plan? You know, the reality is markets are volatile. Markets are unpredictable. Uh, What should you be doing now? What are the dangers of going to cash? We'll talk about all of those issues with David Wagner. Stay tuned. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're visiting this morning with David Wagner. He's a lead portfolio manager at Aptis Capital, also regular contributor for CNBC, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, and Barron's. Uh, if you've missed part of this, we're on every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. and 3 to 4 p.m. You can also listen to our show on our website, broganfinancial.com. Click on radio. David, so inflation, Federal Reserve policy, choppy volatility, economic challenges, a bond market that is moving contrary to anything we've ever seen. Let's talk about what investors need to be doing. First off, I think it's important. You know, I was uh, on Haller and Hilton Hill show a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. And one of the things that I mentioned is, you know, are you an investor or are you a trader? And that if you're a trader, it might be a good time to, to maybe get out right now. Uh, this was several weeks ago. And then, but, you know, most people that we work with, David, are investors. They're planning for their retirement. They're not day traders. Talk a little bit about that question. Are you an investor or a trader? And, and what that means for somebody's short and long-term outlook right now. Yeah, that is a great question. <clears throat> and I'll actually preface with this. What I do for a living is I I pick stocks. But when it comes to my personal portfolio, I actually just invest in ETFs and the funds that we run because we know that investors have a lot of emotional bias, a lot of emotional dependence, especially during periods of volatility. And we know that when you have stress in your life, you can create suboptimal decisions. Investors need to think well during periods of volatility. And our founder, actually, JD, just put out a great piece on that that we can obviously send out. But being a trader, to your point, Jim, you have to be right twice when you are a trader, on the time when you get out and when the time you get back in. And we know that's very difficult in a market. The market is a forward-looking mechanism. So you may feel that the market's very bearish with a lot of macroeconomic uncertainties right now, but I can tell you this from what I've learned, that a lot of that tends to be priced on in. That's already known. The market tries to look through that, and that's what makes being a trader so difficult because you have to start to understand and analyze when the market starts to move past those macroeconomic uncertainties and when the market starts to rise again. Just go back to March of 2020, March 23rd. Everyone was very bearish. The S&P 500 was down 33% from peak to trough. Yet to end the month of March, the market was up like 15%. But at the point of March 23rd, no one has ever felt more bearish or pessimistic in the market. So it's very difficult to time the market, and that's what traders do. And then much like myself, we need to invest for the long term. Well, I'm not a fan of Warren Buffett, and I I know people might not like that, but he actually had an amazing saying. It's not your duty to time the market. It's your ability to get your time in the market. So time in the market is more important than timing the market. And I'm a full big believer in that. And if you actually look at historical data, it pays to remain invested. I mean, there could be a myriad of reasons for not staying invested. I understand that. But at its core, I believe that an investor's fear of a large drawdown or an attempt to timer is why they try to get out. And that's very detrimental to returns because it increases the longevity risk within your portfolio. I mean, if you just look at this data, I pulled this chart this morning. Brad Rafkin, one of the portfolio managers, runs this chart um, basically on a monthly basis because it's that important. And we have data for the S&P 500 going back to 1995. And from 1995 to the end of April, if you were fully invested, your average annualized return from the S&P 500 was 8.4%. 
if you take out the five best days, the five best days, your return would be 6.6% on an annualized basis. That is almost 2% less on an annual basis just because you weren't invested on the five best days. And we know that volatility breeds more volatility. Volatility can be to the downside. Volatility can be to the upside. Look at that example that I just gave last week. Wednesday, the market was up 3%. Thursday, the market was down 3.6%. You get wild swings in the market. And when you have a drawdown, when there's more volatility, that's when you get some of the highest returning days in the market. We saw that during COVID. So if you go back to my statistic, fully invested 8.4%, miss the five best days, you're um, down 6.6%. If you miss the best 40 days over the last 25 years, you actually have a zero return. And that's just missing 40 days in the market right there. So that's, Jim, why it pays to stay invested through these periods right now. That's such great get that data, David. Um, let, let, let's talk a little bit about time horizon and what that means, the, the, un, the importance of time horizon. You know, the, the, the more volatile a portfolio is, the more time it may, you may need for that portfolio to work out and produce a decent return. So just talk a little bit about the difference in what returns can be over a one-year period versus over a seven- or an eight-year period and how important that is in, in people's planning. No doubt. I mean, that to its core, goes back to the comment I said. It's your time in the market. And as you mentioned, Jim, investors need to expand their time horizon. You know, I would like to say that I know what the market is going to do. I wish I could say that. It's my job, and I think I'm good at it. But at its core, no one ever knows what the market is going to do, especially on a daily basis. And I said, as I said, we know that volatil volatility tends to breed more volatility, whether it's up or down. And investors probably focus too much on short-term noise in the market. And that we know that there's a great deal of variability with that on a day-to-day -day basis with different economic, geopolitical, company-specific news that's constantly moving the market. But the best way, the best way, the best method for loss avoidance is to expand your time horizon. So if you look at the probability for negative returns, on a one-day basis, the probability of a negative return for an investor is 46%. If it goes out three months, all right, probability of a negative return over the next three months, historically, it's been 32%. If you take that out to five years, your probability is 12. If you take it out to 10 years, your probability is 7. Take it out to 20 years, your probability is nil, nil. So that's why it's so important to expand your time horizon. Do not make short-term decisions off of short-term daily movements in the market because that's ultimately going to be detrimental to your returns. You have to and keep a long-term time horizon advantage to the market. Right, and that's where the income plan for retirement becomes so critical because we don't want to be spending down assets in the short term that are very volatile because it's way too unpredictable and you could compound your losses by spending those losses if you have to sell and then spend that money. David, I hate that we're out of time. The one thing I do want to say about Aptis is that you all specialize, would this be accurate to say you specialize in hedging drawdown risk with a not more non-traditional approach where it's not just a heavy reliance on bonds, which so many people have used in the past that probably won't be very effective in the future. And I've just got 20 seconds. Can you give out your website? Yeah, our website is aptuscapitaladvisors.com. And Jim, you did a great job talking about what Aptus's daily wake is. Hey, let's try to own more areas of the market that have return drivers with less owning less areas of the market that does not have return drivers, but with the same amount of risk. And we do that through owning long volatility through some type of hedging, which gives us a portfolio that really uh, encapsulates what we call the sequence of returns. That's David Wagner. Thank you so much, David, with Aptus Capital. We've discussed money because your wealth provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for tuning in and have a very blessed weekend. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.